Honey, I am tired of doing the books and all this writing by hand. I'm going out to buy a computer. But Bob, you don't know a thing about them. Ha, I'm smart. How hard could they be to figure out? Hello, how can I help? I want to look at some computers. Would you like an IBM PS2, PC compatible, Apple Macintosh Performa, or Power Mac? Huh? Here's a 486DX2 66 megahertz processor with 8 megabyte of RAM and 256K cache. It has a 420 megabyte, 14 millisecond IDE hard drive. Or would you like a SCSI? A what? It's multimedia with a double speed CD ROM, 16 bit sound card, and a 1 megabyte local bus graphics card. It includes a 14-inch SVGA, 0.28 dot pitch monitor, a mouse, 101 keyboard, and a built-in DLD IDIO. Ah! <laughs> what you say? Have you tried shopping for a computer and experienced the same confusing terms that Bob did? Or maybe the thought of that scenario is your worst nightmare and you're not even going to attempt to buy a computer and embarrass yourself. Hi, my name is Ted. Trying to buy a computer today can be a confusing and frustrating experience. How do you know what system has the tools you need when you don't even know what these terms mean or what the different options enable you to do? Now you can relax, because in part one of this video, I'm going to teach you the computer basics and what these terms mean so you can shop intelligently and buy a system that suits your needs. Then in part two, we'll walk through the buying process, determining your needs, and finding a budget you're comfortable with. Then we'll look at the various channels through which you can buy a computer and how to get the best deal. You may want to get a pencil and paper to take notes. You ready? Let's go. What is a computer? This may seem like a silly question, but the answer may surprise you. A computer is a device designed to control a series of events. Computers exist in thousands of different forms. The most obvious is the personal computer, but they're in your television, your dishwasher, and even your wristwatch. Each of these computers were designed to do a specific task. You could say a personal computer is a high-speed mathematician, a high-speed filing clerk, and a high-speed typist. Every computer is made up of hardware and software. In simple terms, the hardware refers to the physical parts of the computer system, like the hard drive, monitor, and motherboard. Don't worry about these terms for now, I'll describe them later. Software is the program of information or instructions that tells the computer what to do. These instructions may come on a floppy drive or CD-ROM, or may already be installed in your computer. A computer is nothing to fear. It has no more ability to think than a common light bulb. Although some of the things you may have seen a computer do seem impressive, you're only carrying out a fixed set of instructions called a program. The actual thinking was done by the person who wrote the program. You could say that a computer is carrying out the thoughts of its programmer on a very rapid and repeated basis. There are so many things people are using computers for. Some use them to study history or learn a new language. Others use them for financial record keeping for home or business, including doing your taxes. Of course, a very popular use is for desktop publishing to create pieces like these. And my favorite use, games. There are all sorts of games to spend your time and money on, and the list goes on and on. Many people like you and I are very productive using computers without being computer experts or even knowing how to write programs. A computer takes the information that you give it and converts it into a series of numbers using ones and zeros, called binary code. It makes all the calculations and then transfers all the binary code numbers back to information you and I can understand, like letters of the alphabet, graphics, and so on. Let's take a bird's eye view and see how this is done. You enter the information using the keyboard. Electronic pulses are sent to the CPU. Here is where the calculations occur faster than we can think. The information is sent to the monitor where we can see what we've entered. If you like the letter you've written or the banner you've made, you can send the information to the printer, which puts it on paper. Now that you have a basic understanding of what a computer is, Let's take a look at the different types of computers you can buy. There are primarily two types of personal computers. The most popular is the PC compatible, 
meaning it's compatible with the original IBM XT personal computer system. There are so many companies making PCs that it becomes confusing when you try to wade through all the options available. The other type of computer is the Apple Macintosh, or Mac. The Mac comes in a number of different models, but not nearly as many as the PC. However, the Mac is much easier to buy and use because it was developed with the average person in mind. What separates these two types of computers is their operating system. Every computer has built-in software that does the job of instructing the processor how to use the different devices connected to it. Any program running on the computer must interact with this built-in software in order to use any of the hardware. Simply put, the two systems understand different languages. Software is written specifically for either the PC operating system or the Mac operating system. What this means is, a PC will not run software written for a Mac, and a Mac will not run software written for a PC. The Mac has only one operating system, and can run any software written for a Mac computer. The PC, on the other hand, can have a number of different operating systems. The two most common are DOS, for most PC compatibles, and OS2, which is included in computers manufactured by IBM, but can run on any PC compatible. Now let's take a closer look at what makes up the hardware portion of your computer system. In order to help you visualize what people mean when talking about computer options, we're going to take a look at a PC from the inside out. Now this is the case, or console. It holds the hard drives, motherboard, sound card, etc. You can either have a desktop case or a tower case. A tower case may be a mini tower, a mid-sized tower like this one, or a full tower. For home or casual use, desktop or mini tower case is fine. A mid-size or full-size tower is helpful if you want to use your computer for things like CAD, desktop publishing, video or multimedia production, and need room for more boards and peripherals. I'm going to remove the cover of this case so we can see what's inside. Don't try this at home. This is the motherboard, or mainboard. It simply connects all of the external computer parts to the processor chip. Let's take a closer look. This is the motherboard lying flat along the bottom of the case. As you can see, there are other boards plugged into it. This is the processor chip, sometimes called the CPU, which stands for Central Processing Unit. It's the brain of your computer. This chip processes or moves data from one point to another. For example, taking data from the hard drive or CD-ROM and sending it to the monitor, speakers, or printer. You can think of it as the computer's control center, the place where the program instructions are performed. If you want a computer to show video, sound, or animation, you want to get a powerful processor. For Macs, the most powerful processor is ironically called the PowerPC. Other processors found in Macs are the 68,030 in entry-level models and the more powerful 68,040. PC's most powerful processor is the Pentium, sometimes called the 586. Other processors found in PCs are the 486, the 386, which is fast becoming obsolete, and the 286, which is obsolete. To help alleviate confusion about PC processors, here's a chart that shows a speed comparison of the most common chips. A copy of this is included with your video. One term that is common to all computers is megahertz. Without getting too technical, Megahertz specifies the speed for each model of processor chip. For example, the 486 66 MHz processor is faster than the 486 50 MHz, but it's slower than the Pentium 66 MHz chip because the Pentium is a much more powerful processor. This is a hard drive. Like the motherboard, you can't see it from outside the system. The hard drive is where all of your programs and data are stored. When programs are put into your computer, are stored here waiting to be called up when needed. Sound, video, animation, and graphics require lots of hard drive space. So if you're planning to use your computer for multimedia, games, or desktop publishing, you want to get a hard drive with lots of capacity. There are two terms you'll hear associated with hard drives, IDE and SCSI, or SCSI. These terms simply refer to the manner in which the drive is connected to the computer. Both of these interfaces are fine. Both are available on PCs, IDE being the most common. The Mac always comes with a SCSI. This is the floppy disk drive. When you buy software for your computer, it comes on a disk. The disk is still considered hardware, but the information on the disk is the software. 
you insert this disc into the disk drive, sort of like a record player. This drive reads the information and sends it to the processor, which can run the program or copy them onto the hard drive for later access. You can also record information on a disk from your hard drive, give it to someone else, then they can put it on their computer, and voila, they have the information you created. Disks are one way of transferring information from one computer to another. Floppies come in two sizes. The five and a quarter is truly soft or floppy, hence the name, floppy disks. These disks are becoming obsolete, so you may not want to have a five and a quarter inch disk drive in your computer. The new standard size used today is the three and a half inch disk. Although this disk is stiff as a board, it's still called the floppy disk. A word of caution, you cannot put a three and a half inch disk into a five and a quarter inch disk drive, and vice versa. Most software that you buy today comes on a three and a half inch disk, so I recommend a three and a half inch disk drive for your computer. This is a CD-ROM drive. This device reads a CD-ROM and sends the data into your computer. The CD-ROM is similar to a music CD. In fact, the CD-ROM drive will play music CDs when you're not using it for programs. ROM means read-only memory. You cannot record information on it. The CD-ROM holds up to 650 megabytes of data, 600 times as much as a floppy disk. CD drives are available in four speeds, single, double, quad, or six speed. This is how fast the computer can read information on the CD-ROM. Stay away from single speed drives, they aren't fast enough for most multimedia programs. The CD-ROM has opened the door for lots of new software. Because of its ability to store huge amounts of data, whole encyclopedias are put on CD, with CD quality sound, and even full motion video. This is a sound card. It plugs into the motherboard. A sound card enables you to import and store sound. It can also take a stored sound file and play it back through the speakers or headphones. A good sound card can produce as high a quality sound as your CD player. A 16-bit sound card has a better sound quality than an 8-bit card. Sound cards are an option in PC, but come standard in Mac. This display adapter card may also be called a graphics or video card. It controls the image displayed by the monitor. These images are made up of colored dots or pixels. The video card must remember the color of all of the pixels and therefore requires memory of its own. Most video cards come with one megabyte of memory. This is fine for the average user. You've probably heard the term multimedia by now. The combination of a CD-ROM drive, sound and video capabilities is what makes a computer a multimedia system. This device is the monitor. It displays the information and images for the computer. They come in several different sizes. Most people don't need a monitor bigger than 14 or 15 inch. This one is a 15 inch. But they also come in 17, 19, 20, and 21 inch monitors, which are used by those who need big display areas like desktop publishers or multimedia production companies. When buying a monitor, you'll hear terms like VGA or SVGA. VGA stands for Video Graphics Array. Both VGA and SVGA are fine, but you'll get higher resolution and more colors with an SVGA monitor and video card. You may also encounter terms like 0.28 or 0.32 mm. This refers to the dot pitch of the monitor. In simple terms, dot pitch refers to the smallest pixel the monitor can display. The lower the number, the sharper the image. I don't recommend a dot pitch higher than 32 for VGA or 0.28 for SVGA. I briefly want to mention about interlaced and non-interlaced monitors. This refers to the way the image is drawn on the screen. Interlaced monitors have a tendency to flicker, while non-interlaced monitors have a more stable picture. A non-interlaced monitor costs a little more, but it's worth it. The term refresh frequency or refresh rate tells you how many times per second the image is redrawn on the screen. The lower frequency monitors will always flicker. Try not to get a monitor with a refresh rate less than 60 Hz. If you do, you may see a lot of flickering that's bothersome, and it may even give you a headache. Most of the monitor options that I just covered are unique to the PC. Macintosh monitor resolutions are standard according to monitor size. Here again, Mac designers have taken steps to make the Mac less confusing. This is the keyboard. It's like a typewriter keyboard. It has numbers and letters and special command keys that allow you to enter data into your system or give your computer commands. When looking at PCs, you may see the number 101 associated with keyboards. 101 is simply the number of keys on the keyboard. 
This little unit that looks like a mouse is a mouse. With the mouse, you move a cursor and or arrow on the monitor screen. Click on programs or click on commands. This encompasses your basic computer hardware. We'll talk about the printer and other peripherals later on in the video. We now want to explore a very vital but somewhat elusive subject that you need to know when buying a computer, memory. If you've talked to a computer salesperson or have done any research about computers, you've most likely encountered the term megabyte or megabytes of RAM. Understanding how much memory your computer will need to meet your application requirements is important because you need enough RAM and hard drive space to run various programs. Since the computer is an electrical device, it stores data as electrical signals. The ones and zeros we mentioned earlier are stored as on and off signals. Each piece of data or computer instruction is stored as a combination of eight of these on-off signals called a byte. Now stay with me and this will start to make sense. Each byte represents one item of data, like a letter or number. A kilobyte is approximately 1,000 bytes, and a megabyte is 1 million bytes. One megabyte is enough memory to store about 500 pages of typed information. There is one more qualification we have to make in regards to memory, and that's the difference between RAM, ROM, and mass storage. RAM is an acronym for Random Access Memory, any part of RAM can be changed by the processor at any time. Unfortunately, anything stored in RAM is temporary. If you turn off the computer, you lose your information. ROM stands for read-only memory. This is where the BIOS is stored. BIOS means basic input-output system. The BIOS contains the information that tells the computer how to operate all of the devices that are attached to it, such as hard drives, video monitors, keyboards, and printers. The information in ROM is programmed by the manufacturer and can never be changed. The hard drive is a mass storage device, which can retrieve and record information. As I said earlier, all of the programs and data are stored here. You can turn off your computer and the information will still be on the hard drive. To help make this clear, I'd like to use a kitchen as an example of how this all fits together. Imagine that this kitchen is the inside of a computer. Let's put some tags on things to identify what they are. I'll be the CPU. I'm the brain of the computer. Nothing in this kitchen will get done unless I mix ingredients or move things or whatever. These cupboards and drawers will be my hard drive. All of the ingredients I use to make things are stored in the hard drive. This is a stack of appliance manuals. This is my ROM BIOS. It tells me how to use all of the appliances and options of my kitchen. Over here, this counter space will be my RAM memory or workspace. This is where I'll be doing all of my work. In this drawer over here, my hard drive, is my favorite cookbook or a program. This tells me which ingredients I need and how to combine them together to make something useful. Now that I have my program in RAM, I need to go to my hard drive and get out some ingredients or data. As you can see, the hard drive space is much larger than the RAM space. This is because it needs to hold all of the programs and all of the data that I need to do everything that I want to do with my computer. Now some computers are fast, so fast that the RAM memory and hard drive can't keep up. These computers operate more efficiently with cache memory. Cache memory is a small, high-speed work area for the processor to operate in. The last thing I want to discuss about PCs is what we call external ports. These have a variety of names like serial port, parallel port, game port, etc. Without confusing you about which item connects to which port, let me just give you the simple explanation that ports are where you plug in the cables that connect the computer to all of the external components, like the keyboard, mouse, printer, etc. For you who are buying a computer for casual or home use, there will be enough ports for what you need to do on almost any system you can buy. Only if you need a more complex system should you make sure that the console has enough ports to support the peripherals you may add on. Before we wrap up our discussion on hardware, I want to take a quick look at peripherals or add-ons to the computer. There are a number of items that you can add to your computer to increase the variety of tasks it can perform. Like this modem. This enables you to send data to another computer over the phone line. 
Modems are also needed if you want to access the internet or online services like Prodigy, America Online, and CompuServe. You may see numbers like 9600 or 14400 BPS. BPS stands for bits per second, which simply refers to the speed that the computer can send information over the phone line. Some modems include fax capabilities that enable you to send and receive faxes with your computer. Most modems are built into the computer console. However, external versions are available. This joystick is a must-have if you want to play games with your computer. This is how you control the movement of action figures or vehicles during the game. A set of speakers enables you to experience stereo sound with your computer. Multimedia systems come with speakers. If you want to add a set of speakers to your system later, it's important to get a set made specifically for use with a computer. CD-ROM drives also fall into the category of peripherals, because if you have a system without one, you can add an external or internal drive later on. This scanner does just that. It scans a picture and imports it into your computer, allowing you to put it into your newsletter or whatever you're working on. This flatbed or full page scanner scans a full page image. This hand scanner is less expensive, but it only scans a half a page at a time. Okay, let's say you've created a fantastic newsletter or just finished writing a letter to mom, and now you need to take what's in the computer and get it on paper. That's what the printer is for. Let's cover the most common types of printers. This dot matrix printer prints images by striking metal pins against an ink ribbon to put a spot of ink on the paper. Dot matrix printers come in 9 pin or 24 pin styles. The 24 pin prints a better text quality than the 9 pin. Dot matrix printers are very inexpensive and print text very rapidly, but they have the lowest image quality. Inkjet and Bubblejet printers use fine ink droplets to create images on paper. It has a fairly high quality text printout and is an affordable way to print full color documents for presentations. The downside is you need special paper to get the best images and the ink refills are kind of pricey. Also, the ink is water soluble and if the paper gets wet, the image will stain. The print speed of an inkjet printer is fairly slow. A laser printer uses the same technology as a photocopier to print images on plain paper. It has the highest text and image quality and a fairly fast printing speed. Color laser printers are the most expensive of these three. When you're shopping for a printer, always test them at the store. Evaluate the printout from all of the printers you're considering buying. Also, watch the printer print a demo page to get a feel for the print speed. Well, that about covers the hardware portion of the computer. Congratulations! You now know as much or more as the other millions of computer owners. You no longer have to run and hide or quickly change the subject when the conversation turns to computers. You may even be able to dazzle them with your understanding of RAM and cache memory using the kitchen analogy. Okay, let's move on to what makes your computer able to do all these fancy things. Software. If you remember, at the beginning of this video we said that software is the program of information or set of instructions that tells the computer what to do. Let me get technical for a moment. Software needs an environment to operate in. This environment is the operating system. If you remember from our previous discussion, there are many types of operating systems, and each program is written to run on only one of them. So be careful that the software you buy is written for the operating system of your computer. This brings up a point. If you have not decided on a type of computer yet, I recommend determining what software you want, then buy the computer with the appropriate operating system, memory speed, and so forth needed to run the software. Software can be basically put into six categories. The first is word processing, a fancy way to say writing. Word processing software allows you to create written documents. You can then change words with the click of a mouse, correct misspelled words, change the letter size and type style, and perform many other chores a typewriter can't even attempt to do. Next is spreadsheets and accounting software. With spreadsheet software, you can create financial reports for businesses or nonprofit organizations. The higher end spreadsheet programs can convert the numbers into charts and graphs. There's a lot of accounting software available to help you do finances for home or business. There's even software to help you do your taxes for Uncle Sam. Third is the organizer or database. Database software can take any information like numbers, addresses, names, etc., and organize and file it. 
If you were to do a direct mailing to customers of your business, a database program is what you would use to organize the customer list. Fourth is desktop publishing. With these programs, you can arrange pictures and words to create newsletters, brochures, banners, cards, or anything else you can think of. The fifth category is graphics. These programs have a wide variety of capabilities. Engineers and architects use these programs to design things such as homes or equipment. Graphic designers can create artwork for publishers or advertising agencies to use in print advertising. And last of all is games. With a joystick and lots of memory, you can get hooked on playing all sorts of games available on the market today. There are so many software titles that fall into each of these categories. You may need help deciding which program will work best for you. I suggest asking friends and co-workers, or even software salespeople, what program they recommend. Software companies have made it easy for you to know what hardware is needed to run their software. They put the system requirements right on the box. Let me show you what I mean. This WordPerfect version 6.0 requires the following. A 386 PC with a VGA monitor, Windows 3.1, 32 megabytes of hard drive space, 6 megabytes of RAM, and a mouse. And here's a desktop publishing program. This one requires a 386 PC, Windows 3.0, 40 megabytes of hard drive space, 2 megabytes of RAM, and a mouse. Remember, these are the bare minimum requirements for the software to operate. To really run these programs the way we like, you'll need more processor power and RAM memory than recommended. You're now armed with a vital weapon to carry with you when shopping for a computer. Knowledge. Knowledge that will give you the confidence to buy the system you need and want. This brings us to part two of our video, How to Buy a Computer. Buying a computer is a little like buying a new wardrobe. Unless you define what you need these clothes for, you may come to work dressed in overalls when in fact the job requires business attire. In the same way, you need to define what you want to do with your computer. I've identified four user categories that most people fit into. This may help you get started in defining what you need. The first group is the casual user. The casual user wants a computer just to have it. They may use it to keep home financial records, or write letters, or as an educational tool for the kids. The next group is the home or small business group. This group needs a computer system to handle the office functions of bookkeeping, word processing, or maybe even simple publishing. The third group is the specific purpose group. This group needs a computer to do computer-aided design or architecture, desktop publishing, video production, or multimedia presentation. Of course, the last one is the game group. The primary use of this computer is playing games. One of the questions you want to ask yourself when defining your needs is, what will suit my purpose best, a PC or a Mac? Let's take a look at some of the pros and cons of each type of computer. The most obvious distinction between PCs and Macs is ease of use. Macintosh systems are much easier to learn how to operate. If you're in the casual use group, this may be the system for you. There is a downside to this, however. The features that allow a Mac to be easily operated use a lot of system resources. This causes a Mac to run substantially slower than a PC in the same price range. PCs are normally easier and less costly to upgrade than Macs. If you want to start out slow and build your system up as you learn, start with a lower-end 486 PC. Upgrading a Mac usually requires a trip to the dealer, and since the new parts are usually Mac-specific, the cost can be higher. Macs excel at graphic manipulation. If you're going to do strictly graphics work such as desktop publishing or presentations, a Mac is probably the right choice. Last of all, if games are important to you, there's no substitute for a high-end PC. If the decision still isn't clear, you may want to get opinions from friends or co-workers. Another key question that needs to be answered is, how much computing power do I need? If you don't know what you're going to use your system for, how do you know what to buy? For instance, if you want a small home system to do a little letter writing or to let the kids use it for educational purposes, a PC 486SX or a Mac Performa might suffice. But if you want to do a lot of number crunching and desktop publishing, a Pentium PC or Power Mac would be best. You should also define how much RAM memory and hard drive storage you'll need. You can answer this part by deciding how many different programs you want to use and how much space they take up. Remember, it's better to get more memory if you can swing it financially. Once you've defined what you want to use your system for, I would encourage you to shop for software. 
Look on the box for what each software program requires. This will be a guide to buying a computer that has the proper tools you'll need. Now let's look at one more issue that may rein in what you've defined as your computing needs. Budget. You may decide on a system that has optimum computing power, the fastest processor available, more memory than the Pentagon needs, and all the newest gadgets, only to find out you'll need to mortgage your house and your firstborn to buy it. Set your budget before you begin to shop. If you don't, you may walk out spending a lot more than you can comfortably afford. Financing your computer is a viable way to purchase a system, but you don't want to overextend yourself. Keep in mind, the value of anything you buy will decrease very rapidly. After you've had the system a few months, you may be able to get half the price you paid for it. If you've had it for over a year, you're lucky to get 25% of the original price. Set your budget to what you can afford today. All right, you've defined your needs, you know what you want, and how much you're willing to spend. Now it's time to face the computer world head on. Time to talk to those intimidating computer salespeople and buy your first computer. Well, now that I've bombarded you with all this information, let's relax and talk about buying your first computer system. There are basically three types of outlets that you can buy a computer from. Large retail discounters like Walmart, Target, Staples, and others offer low computer prices, but they offer little if any after-sale support. If you have a problem, you need to send it back to the manufacturer or find a local technician who knows how to fix it. Salespeople may not be able to answer all of your questions, so you'll be on your own determining which system to buy. Your local independent retailer can't compete with the lower prices of the discounter, but they offer the best after-sale support. Your salespeople are more skilled and well-versed about the computers they sell. They'll be able to help you through the maze of options available. If even after watching this video a few times, you still don't feel confident about buying a computer without sufficient sales support, I recommend buying from a local retailer. The price will be higher, but the support you'll receive to help get your system up and running will be well worth it. Buying a computer through mail order is one way to get the best price. Mail order companies can offer the lowest prices because there's no middleman market. However, there are many risks in buying mail order. The biggest is that you never know what you're getting. Although there are many reputable mail order companies out there, a lot of them use very cheap and sometimes even used parts to build their systems. Your technical support is also sometimes limited. If you're going to buy a mail order system, look into the company first. Check to see if they have the toll-free technical support number and make sure they offer at least a one-year warranty on all parts. If you know exactly what type of system you want and you're confident with your knowledge of computer terms and technology, buying through mail order may be the way for you to go. I would recommend picking up a copy of Computer Shopper at your grocery or drugstore. It's full of companies selling by mail, and there are also a lot of good articles that may assist you in your decision. The most important part of buying a computer is shopping around and negotiating. Here are some hints to help you along. First, make a list of the options you'd like to have. Also, some places are more willing to negotiate toward the end of the month or the end of the quarter to meet their quota. Find the person who's authorized to make concessions. If they won't budge on the price, Maybe they'll agree to some add-ons, like extra software or a color printer instead of black and white. If you're ready to buy a complete system from console to printer and everything in between, ask for a discount on the complete package. Many times, stores are more willing to give a discount if they're getting additional revenue from a printer, software, or other peripheral. Like I said, don't forget to shop around. Prices can vary $500 or more on similar systems. And then, when you've finally decided what you want, go for it. Don't let fear hold you back. If you wait till you know everything about computers and just the right system comes along, you'll be waiting forever. Part of the learning process is starting at the beginning and growing from there. You may discover that you didn't get the exact system you needed the first time out. That's okay. Most likely you'll be able to upgrade and get just what you need later on. Well, how do you feel now? You may feel like you've got a piece of the pie, but the rest is still somewhat confusing. Watch this tape again. Take notes. And if you know someone who's into computers, ask questions. Remember, the only foolish questions are the ones you don't ask. As you begin to shop for a computer, researching what's available and asking questions, an amazing thing will happen. All of this will begin to make sense, and you'll start to sound like a computer nerd. Well, maybe not that last part. But you will find that the mysteries about computers will clear up, and they're not all that hard to understand. I've enjoyed sharing the world of computers with you and wish you the best in your new adventure.